Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Today on the podcast, my guest is Chuck Whitworth, also known to many on Twitter as Chief Chuck. Chuck is a retired Navy Chief Petty Officer, and today we're going to explore the unique roles and responsibilities of Chief Petty Officers and why they're so important in the U.S. Navy. As a former Navy guy, I'm excited about this episode, and I know you will be as well. Two Navy guys and a microphone, this is going to be a lot of fun. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to episode 11 of the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Chuck Whitworth, who is also known by many as Chief Chuck. Chuck is a retired Navy Chief Petty Officer who served 24 years as a P3 flight engineer. In his time in in the Navy, he logged more than 5,000 hours in the sky looking for guys like me. Yes, the P3 Orion is a submarine hunter, and we might get on that subject a little bit today. But he came up through the enlisted ranks and became a Chief Petty Officer, And that's one of the most important jobs in the Navy. So I'm excited to have him on board today to talk about that role and his views on leadership in general. So Chuck, welcome aboard. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. It's it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Well, uh, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about your background at first. Tell us a little bit about what you did uh, in the Navy. And also, I understand you spent a little bit of time in the Army as well. Yeah, I did. It was uh, it was interesting. I, I grew up in uh, rural northeast Georgia in, in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, a very small town, you know, less than a couple thousand people. And I graduated high school in 1981. But prior to that, in 1980, I had already signed up for the Army and I knew I had to get out of a small farming town. Uh, couldn't couldn't work in a textile mill or live in a trailer in my parents backyard. Uh, the world called to me. And, and so I was like, I didn't want to go to college because I was not a very good student. So I just said, I'll go in the army. Um, went in the army, was a welder in the army and got tired of camping out for a living. <laughs> and I really want to do aviation. I've been an aviation freak since I was a little kid. It's fascinated me. Uh, the army said that they would let me fly, but they wanted me to fly helicopters. And at the time I wanted to work on airplanes. So The Navy took me and uh, started there and was in a helicopter squadron my first tour, H3s and H2s. And your listeners are going to have to be really old to remember an H3 or an H2. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, then I became, I went to a VP squadron and fell in love with the P3 and uh, got mentored by a lot of good guys. And they're like, hey, why don't you become a flight engineer? Uh, And I did. I became an instructor. me tops instructor and flight engineer. Uh, like I said, about 5,000 hours. I got to see the world. Um, best 24 years I ever spent in my life. But you know, the thing that everybody can relate to that's ever been in the military is, is the people. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you go into, when you go into battle with, with, with your friends and your family and your brothers and sisters, uh, that's what it was all about. So yeah, mm-hmm. I did that and then retired in 2007 And did like what every, just about almost every Navy guy does when he retires, he turns around and goes to work for the Navy as a civilian. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. So I've been doing that since 2007, still doing it today. I'm a senior program manager and, you know, just taking it from there, waiting to draw my second retirement. That's, that's the way to do it. So one one of the things um, that's interesting, you came up through the ranks of the Navy and um, me being a Navy guy myself, um, the process is interesting because you start off, um, in, in, when you start off enlisted, you're, you're a doer basically. And as you grow in the ranks, you become a leader. You get into more leadership roles until you get to that chief petty officer status where you're primarily doing leadership. So right. what was the transition like for you? When did you start becoming a leader? Um, you know, how did you get more and more responsibility during your time in the Navy? 
Well, I, you know, I think, John, one of the ways that I did it was, you know, I always tie everything back to my dad. My dad gave me a strong Southern work ethic. And he always implored me to just, you know, always try to be better. You know, I remember he told me, he goes, son, he goes, I don't care if you grow up to be a garbage man, be the best garbage man there mm-hmm. is. But my dad didn't just do that. He led by example. He ran for councilman. Oh, he, wow. got elected, he got elected to be a councilman. And part of the, his job was the sanitation department. And he spent a whole, you know, Saturday riding the back of the trash truck. And as a young teenager, or young person, I was mortified, but yeah, I learned that he taught me that you learn by doing and you learn to lead by example and lead you by. don't ask other people to do what you wouldn't do. Right. So I saw this responsibility and I saw these great leaders that I was around and I said, I want to do that. Mm. So, you know, I, you know, becoming a plane captain faster than anybody else had ever had on the helos, uh, becoming a flight engineer instructor in, you know, 500 hours, trying to constantly set that bar. But as you mentioned, chief is the pinnacle of it. It is. And, yeah. and the Navy's unique. Um, up until just a few years ago, the defining thing was you change uniforms as an enlisted person. Right. Um, it, when you became, we still had dungarees when I was in, you lost yeah. your dungarees, mm-hmm. you got your khakis. Um, today, not so much with the camouflage uniforms, but with that uniform change in the Navy where we're different than other branches of the service, is for the chief petty officer, the best way I can explain it to people that were never in the Navy is if they were in another branch of a service like the Marines or the Army, well, the Marines understand, but the Army in particular is just consider a chief petty officer or a senior chief or a master chief, consider us a warrant officer. Right. We're, we're in that middle management role. We're technical experts, right. but we're also tasked with doing leadership and management. So we're, we're on that balance line. So that was the transition for that is when you become, when you get selected for chief and, you know, I was still in the days of initiation and I'll probably put, I got, I could write a whole book on initiation, <laughs> um, but it need a parental advisory. Label. Right. But, you know, we did that and that, that transition kind of took you away that you had to learn to be the leader that you had to t- learn to take your hands off. Mm. You had to quit being the person to go, just give me that wrench and I'll do it. Right, right. You had to quit being that person. You had to be the, let me show you how to do this and let me teach you how to do it. And let me be accountable for the, for the, for the results and responsible for the results. But I'm going to give you the art of doing it and you're going to do it and you're going to do it yourself. And that's a huge leadership lesson right there in itself. So you transition from being the doer to the leader. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about comparing and contrasting military and civilian leadership a little bit later. But sure. that seems to be a big challenge I see with um, people who get promoted in civilian companies, right? They, they, they're good at doing something, but then um, they get promoted. Now they're the manager, but they like to keep doing that thing. So they don't make that transition. And in, and in the Navy, when you became that chief petty officer, that was a clear line that you cross over into the, now you're leading people, you're, you're doing less doing and more leading, right? It is. And it's, you know, even in the officer ranks, when, when you know, a, an officer, when you go to do your department head tour, when you become selected for the XO, mm. it, it's still that for us, it's that same transition and it's a leadership transition of, for me, it was, do I have enough faith I always had enough faith in myself and getting myself promoted and being the num- ranked number one, being sailor of the quarter, sailor of the year, whatever. That was important until you mm-hmm. get to that transition point And you learn that ha- you have to have faith, not in just yourself, but you have to have faith in the abilities that you've been taught and that you picked up to be able to let go. Mm-hmm. And that is the, that is a huge leap of faith. And I don't think even in some leadership classes now in the civilian world, I don't know that they adequately can relay that, 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 that feeling right, or, right. or what that is about. You have to learn to let go and trust and trust in yourself that you've taught your subordinates that a, they can look to you and trust you to back them up. And, but B you've also been that technical expert to pass on what you know. Right. Nobody, nobody likes that guy that's the corporate knowledge because everybody can be replaced. Right. So the more you share it, you have to learn to, to let go. That's, that was the hardest part for me. 
Mm, yes. Yeah, that's and that's important. And I think that's a problem we have today in leadership is that uh, many leaders who are good at what they do are promoted and then they can't let go of doing what right. they do. Yeah, yeah, that's a big problem. So how did it affect you when you when you began to understand that you were now a leader and people depended on you? They looked to you for the answers, right? So you made that transition. You came up through the ranks. Suddenly, every you've got young sailors looking to you for answers. How did how did that change in your mindset? What what you know what was that like uh, going through that transition? Just having people look to you and say, you know, Chief, what do I do? <laughs> how, yeah, how was that for you. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I had an advantage, you know, being a, a flight engineer. You're the flight engineer position itself is the enlisted crew supervisor. So mm-hmm. you, I may have had a, a, a chief or a senior chief on the crew. And as a first class flight engineer, I was still the crew leader. So I had to learn a lot of diplomacy and nuance to the actual physical art of directing people what to do. But you're right. You know, they teach us early in chief's initiation that one of the, one of the things you, and it's in our, in the chief's creed is Ask the chief has been now be asked the chief is a household world word in the Navy, mm. uh, not just from enlisted, but from officers as well. Um, you know, many junior officers, their department, they'll go to their department head and the department will say, well, what did the chief say? Yeah. Did you ask yeah. the chief. Yeah. Same thing with the junior setters. They'll be like, well, what did the chief say? Did you ask the chief. <laughs> um, and honestly, it's, it's a great transition because for me, it was, it was becoming that center focal point of people that it wasn't too many people see it as that's the ego trip that mm-hmm. now people are coming to me. They're coming to the King. They're coming to the, I'm the all knowing I'm the all powerful to me and to a lot of other good chiefs. It was, it's very humbling. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why you go through some of the things you go through in initiation is to learn to humble you. And yeah. it's a humbling experience to be knowing that, that this junior sailor is either coming to ask you about life advice, finance advice, career advice, all kinds of things. And so it, it's, it's, it's humbling, but it's also a great burden of responsibility, which is another difference that leaders and bosses, you know, leaders have responsibility. And, it's, and it's, I say it's a burden, but I don't mean that in a way that's a pain in the butt. I mean, it's, it, it weighs on you and it makes you think more critically and it made mm. me think better mm, um, exactly. i was always that guy i could pop off an answer like that i would right. pop off an answer thought i knew it all but when i realized that someone else was at stake here and some especially junior sailors when i'm going to go ask the chief what he thinks man it makes you slow down and it makes yeah. you think your response through very very carefully and it mm. makes you weigh all the possible outcomes if i tell this kid this a b c d e can happen so it makes you really, really, really became, can become a very good critical thinker mm. uh, and, and you slow your process down. And so for me, that's what it helped me do is, hey, take everything into consideration, take everything into an account and also made me way more empathetic than I ever was because mm. I was that cocky first class mm. that, that I was that guy. Mm-hmm. It, it made me a whole lot more empathetic to people in the other side of the story and to make me ask Hey, what's this kid going through? What's this, what's this person going through? You know, my Lieutenant comes to me, his hair's on fire. You can tell he just came out of the XO's office. (laughs) I've been there by the way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the easiest response in the world is to have some fun and go, gee, I don't know, Lieutenant, you're in charge. You tell me that's the easiest response in the world. It's the stupidest response in the world. Right. Right. My thing had to be like LT, just calm down. It's all right. Take a breath. Yeah, yeah, it'll be all right. Let's go out in the hangar deck. Let's talk this through. Right. So that, that for me, that was a good transition point too, and a great personal learning experience that helped me ever since. Uh, that's great. No, I think that's you've touched on a lot of things right there, but um, you you touched on empathy as well, and just sort of, you know, when you have the responsibility for other people, you know, it there's a something that clicks that you say, Oh, you know, it's it a, a short answer isn't right now. I've got to think through what right. I'm going to respond to because these people depend on me. And I right. think that, and when you, when you recognize that and realize that, then you start becoming a better leader, right? That you, you recognize that your decisions, your, your words have consequences and have deeper meaning than just when you are a doer. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So, you know, I, I, I touched on this a little bit uh, in the introduction, but the, in, in my opinion, and being uh, our formal, former uh, naval officer, uh, I believe that the chief petty officer is a very unique role in the Navy, uh, especially, and I think it's an important role. And um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's critically important in, in, in our Navy tradition. That is just a role that's always been there, and it's been an important part of, of the Navy over the years. And um, you wrote an article on your website, which I really liked, and it was called, uh, What Exactly is a Navy Chief? And, right. um, you know, having served with uh, a number of chiefs uh, on my days on, uh, on the Tennessee, I really, I really felt emotional about that because um, that really touched upon the chiefs that I served with. It, it was, you know, that personality type. Uh, was just like the chief, the chiefs I've served with. So, wow. touch a little bit about the the Navy chief itself and why that role is so important. And and what in in that you know that essay, what were some of the key points of what a Navy chief really is? Well, you know, I mean, I think what it really comes down to is is the the reason we're unique is you know in the Navy especially. You know, they they recognized you know back in nineteen in 1863 that it was time to they recognized the technical experts in their rate. And they also realized too, that at the time that the Navy would probably never grow to the size of the army. So mm-hmm. we knew there weren't going to be as many officers, right. you know, we couldn't have a battalion size, you know, on a, on a Navy ship. It's, it's sometimes it's less than 30. Right. Sometimes right. it's as much as 5,000 on a carrier on a, in a squadron. It's four to 500 people. There just aren't enough officers to go around. And Mm -hmm. quite honestly, logistically, you can't support that many, you know, bosses. Right. So when when we take the charge and we take our our oath and creed as a chief, you know, it's explained to us. And it's it's really one of those things you 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 understand and you you gain an understanding that you are not going to be in the spotlight anymore. Um, in common terms, you would be, you know, the Sigma, the shaman, mm-hmm. um, you know, sometimes you're the, you're the, the conciliatory and the mafia, you know, you're the guy that's got a whisper in the ear, man, you're behind the scenes and you're, you're actually just, you're making things happen. You know, yes. our motto is results, not excuses. Mm. Um, so for the chief, and we're also part of our charges to train junior enlisted and junior officers. Yes. And, yeah. and and a lot of officers will take that the wrong way of going, well, I'm not going to take a lesson from an enlisted guy. And that's not the way it's meant at all. That is absolutely opposite of what it's meant. I'm not there to teach you how to be an officer. That's why you went to the academy, ROTC, direct commissioning. You learned to be an officer at Knife and Fort School. I'm not here to teach you which fork to use for a salad. I don't care. What I'm here to teach you. I still don't know, by the well, way, Chuck. <laughs> oh, really? I thought no, you guys learned it. I, I don't know. They always say that we learned that, but I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, my job is to take the junior officer who is new to the military environment, probably, mm-hmm. has only been around other officers. And there's a reason why they expose you guys at the academy, ROTC, whatever. Your company commander is going to be a Marine gunny or a Navy chief. There's a reason we want to expose you to the perspective of the enlisted sailor, because there's way more enlisted sailors than there are officers, but we need you to make you that leader, to make you that, that empathetic XO. Well, sorry, there's never been an XO that was empathetic <laughs> to make you that empathetic CO, right. and that hard ass XO, right. To make you, to make you get to that point as a junior officer, my job was to take and just kind of mentor you and go, sir, I don't know that I'd say that that way to those guys. Why don't you say it like this mm. and then let you go out and you give that command. And all of a sudden the troops are like, yes, sir. Devo said this, here we go. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing of the chief and the chief also for the, for the junior sailor is I need to train him to replace me. I need to bring them up and make leaders out of them. I need to make them to where they can work mm. with their junior officers. When we're all gone, then the tradition of the Navy carries on. Yes. So it's become, you know, part of being the chief is, you know, people will call it, try to compare it in the civilian world. You're a middle manager. Well, you're yeah. not really a middle manager at all. You, you're that go between, you're that bridge between the, the enlisted ranks and the officer yeah. ranks. Yeah. Yeah. And you're the flow. You're just a flow of communication back and forth. And it's to get the mission accomplished. 
to get it done efficiently and to bring everybody home safely. I'm not, I'll tell you, Navy chiefs, we're not strategists. People go, the chiefs run the Navy. Well, we do in kind of a background kind of way. But the reason they say that the chiefs are the backbone of the Navy is just like your body. We're the spine, man. We hold all the parts together. We don't make the decision. The brain makes the decision. The arms and the legs execute. We're that person that carries the signals. That's we're the spine. That's why yeah, we're the backbone. Yeah, backbone. I like I'm not that. a. I'm not a. I'm not a strategist. I'm not an expert in tactical naval warfare. That's not my job. Mm. My job is to let the officers sit and make the tactics, and then tell me, Chief, here's what we need to do. Yes, sir. Here we go. And my job is to go to the deck plate and go. And this is a key point that we'll talk about in the difference between civilian and military. Mm. My job is to go to the deck plate and not say, Hey. The CO, XO, DIVO, department head, LT, they didn't say that. Hey, boys, girls, we're going to go do this. Who said? Chief said. Chief said, yeah. Because if you as the officer made a really bad tactical decision, it's still my fault. I gave the order to the troops. You have to maintain that decorum, the respect, that's tradition. They can get mad at the chief all they want to. I don't care. They can say, Chief, that was a stupid decision. And I'll go, yep, it sure was, man. I guess we should, I should have rethought that. I'll talk to the department head about that. Right. But my job is also to go to the department head before that and go, hey, that's really a bad idea, sir. Why yeah. don't we think about this? <clears throat> so it's just that about, you're, you're the communicator. That's all. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a trusted advisor to the, the officer ranks, right? So you're that, yeah. that conduit to the enlisted sailor. But you're also the mentor to the young junior sailors as well. So you're yeah. you're connecting. I like that uh, the backbone of the Navy, um, in in a way you, the way you illustrated it. You're not the brain. You're not the arms and legs. But you're nope. that uh, you're the connect. You know, connecting everything together. And that's exactly what I saw in my time in the Navy as well. They were that conduit, that uh, connection point between the enlisted sailor and the the officers. Yeah, yep, absolutely. absolutely. Thanks for listening to Deep Leadership. We'll be right back after a brief intermission. Hey, leaders. If you're anything like me, you drink coffee to power through your morning. But what about in the afternoon? For me, I start getting a little sleepy and unfocused around 2 p.m. So I like to do something to get me recharged and refocused. I've tried a bunch of different energy drinks. I've even tried that stuff that's supposed to last five hours. Most are expensive and cause you to crash later in the afternoon. I was introduced to a, a really good product by a fellow veteran. He told me to try Strike Force Energy. Strike Force is a veteran-owned company founded by a Navy SEAL, and their products are all made in the USA. Strike Force Energy is a liquid flavor pack that you can add to any beverage. It has zero calories, zero carbs, and zero sugar. Each pack contains 80 milligrams of caffeine. I actually add two packs and a liter of water in the afternoon. I get my water, my energy, and the great taste of Strike Force throughout the afternoon. I personally prefer the original flavor. Strike Force Energy is offering a discount to all the listeners of Deep Leadership. Go to strikeforceenergy.com and enter the discount code I have the watch, one word, I have the watch, for a 20% discount on your order. Strike Force Energy, fuel for your fight. So we touched on this a little bit, and one of the important roles of a Navy chief is training, uh, well, I say training, but um, breaking in, if you will, new junior officers. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll tell you, you know, my story, <clears throat> I showed up to the USS Tennessee. I was an 01. I was an ensign. That's a butter bar. That's pretty much the lowest thing uh, in the Navy. Uh, and um, I was assigned to my first uh, my first division. and um, It was a reactor controls division, and I had a chief petty officer that had been in the Navy almost as many years as I'd been alive. And so, you know, as a a young junior officer, I found myself in a really interesting position. So how do I effectively lead this group of men when I have a fraction of the experience of the chief uh, in this division? So talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, some maybe some interactions you had with junior officers and what were the ones what were the junior officers that that did it right you know what were the what did they do right uh, and what did you look for for the right type of personality 
in that leader? Because I'm sure you get all sorts of types depending on mm-hmm. where they got their commission and their attitude towards enlisted and what have you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the short answer is what I looked for when we get a, a, a new core of officers to come and they would check in, you know, typically they get to the squadron. Um, they would already be a lieutenant or a lieutenant JG because they'd gone through flight school. Right, right. They'd gone through primary and secondary. They had to go to the RAG and get their training. Um, every now and then we would get, uh, you know, a maintenance. We get an LDO. LDOs are different, though. They're easy. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we get we get one that was just a maintenance rate or a technical rate that came in as an ensign. And we also got a, a lot of academy uh, over their junior, senior year. You know, they would come out. We called it summer camp. Yeah, midshipmen. But, yeah, yeah. but they'd come, they'd come to the squadron. So, you know, inevitably they got turned over to the chief's mess, which was, I don't, I wouldn't have wanted to do that, but anyway, <laughs> they, uh, you know, the first thing you look for is just the willingness to listen. Yes. Thank you know, you. And, and it's, yeah. it's that way with everybody, man. Mm-hmm. When you're new, you know, you got two ears and one mouth, you know, shut your cake hole, listen to what I have to tell you. Um, and, and we can make it go good or bad either way, depending on how much you want to impress me with your, you know, your John Paul Jones rendition that I'm a Navy officer. Okay, that's cool, man. Great. You know, you look really good with that sword or whatever. But, you know, I, I like it. But here's here's how you're going to have to – here's what's going to happen to you if you take that crap down into the to the hangar spaces. Um, and, and then in true chief fashion, I would get the ones that were determined, and I'd just turn them loose. You know, I didn't have to do anything. I'd just turn right. them loose to the pits and go, okay, you walk down the hangar deck and tell those guys how to do their job. Right, right. And they come back about six hours later and go, hey, chief, can we have a talk? Yeah, yeah. you can go buy me a beer and we'll have a lot of talk. Yeah. But the really good ones that you would get, they, they understood that they wanted to learn. They were sponges. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, in a lot of the way that we carried ourselves as, as a chief made a lot of a difference too, but you would get the new officers in and the ones you could tell the ones and I could call it. I got to the point to where I could tell you which kid was going to be a CO one day. I could tell you which kid was going to be an Admiral. Um, I never did really, I haven't called it. Well, I did call a chief of naval operations, but he had to turn it down prior to that. But whatever. Wow. Um, <laughs> Mike, Mike Moran, I flew with Mike Moran, the one, the oh, wow. uh, most recent one that had to turn it down because of some stuff. But um, anyway, you could tell. I mean, you could tell because in it, all you could tell, it wasn't any, not that they stood up straighter or they looked better in their uniform, but they had that in their eyes when they watched you, when they would listen to you and then they would watch you and then you would catch them as you were talking to the troops. You catch this ensign or this lieutenant, he's standing there and you can, he's, he's not seeing you, he's watching you. Mm. And he's absorbing this. You can almost see his lips moving. Like, okay, I need to say that line. Okay, Chief's walking like that. He's got that look. He knows when to make the emphasis on this. It's almost, they were sponges. And you mm. could tell that. I was like, man, this guy, this guy or this girl, this is going to go far, man. Yeah. Because yeah. that's how, that's how they did it. And, and honestly enough, I'll tell you since, since you brought it up as I, as you go on, there's a whole lot of, of misconception about the academies. Yeah. I can't, well, yeah. I can't speak for the army. I can speak obviously for the Navy. People always give the Naval Academy graduates a, a rash, man. And it's so totally unfounded. Mm. So totally unfounded. I've worked for every type of officer and flavor that they come in. And as they got more senior, the, the Academy, graduates were they weren't better officers they were just it almost you expected a certain behavior out of them and they gave you the opposite they were probably the most coolest laid-back officers to work for and I don't know why I mean I had a good friend of mine that went to high school with me he graduated the academy we've talked about it he can't really explain it I can't really explain it it's magic we don't know but you know academy grads they're not the ring knocker they're not Iceman from Top Gun that everybody pitches. In <laughs> we can dispel that myth there. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I served alongside you know ROTC and Academy guys, and and I honestly, you know, at my level, you couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, and there was a there was a level of integrity from the Academy guys that you could tell that um, was pretty special. Like they were. <laughs> They were straight, you know, the straight and narrow. They're going to do it. They're going to do things right, you know. And um, so there was something about them that, uh, you know, really stood out when you were around them. You're like, this is a this is a man of high integrity, you know. Absolutely. You knew that right from the start. So, well, you you touched on some things, and it's really good. And and you know, uh, 
if those people are listening to the podcast and you might be a new leader or you might be a future leader and you're wondering like, how do I become an effective leader? And you touched on three things. And one was listen first, you know, two ears, use your ears, uh, learn, learn quickly. And the other thing you said was observe, observe your senior employees and what they're doing and, and, and soak it all in, be that sponge, mm-hmm. right. And be, and, and, and take it in and, and be valuable. Don't, um, don't think that you know what you're doing and don't, don't try to fake it because everybody knows it when you're faking it. Right. So yep. you know, those are some really good, good key points there. So, um, and, and making that transition to civilian leadership, you've been out of the Navy for what, uh, 12 years, 13 years. Yeah. And, um, so you've had a chance to see, uh, civilian leadership now too. So compare and contrast, uh, what do you see different, uh, between leadership as it's practiced in the military and then leadership as you see in, in, uh, the civilian world in general? I mean, maybe not so much your work, but in general, right. what you see. Yeah. Well, in general, yeah, because I've, I've worked with industry, you know, the Boeings, Lockheeds, mm-hmm. you know, everybody, small manufacturing companies, metal work. The thing that I see, and you touched on this, and this is what one of the things that when I first started following you, one of the things that you touched on, it just it drove me backwards in my chair because I'm like, this guy, this is exactly what I'm thinking. Mm. One of the big differences is leadership isn't taught. It's not, it's not a focus. Yes. Just like for a doctor, nobody tries to teach them bedside manner. Mm. And that should be the first thing they should be trying to teach them. You go to school for a for business degree. The first thing, if you're going to go out into the business world, the first thing you should start teaching you is this is how you lead. There's a difference between management and leadership. Anybody that's ever been in school, we know transactional, transformational. We know all that. But seeing how do you put that in product, what is transformational? What are some yeah. examples of that? Yeah. Um, we need to focus on that. That's the first thing is it needs to be more focused on. Because in the military, if you – you show any promise whatsoever, your leaders are going to start poking you to learn to be a new leader. Right, right. Take my place. Somebody's going to have to take, always be training your replacement. Right. I think in the civilian world, too many people think they're, that I am, I am not expendable. I'm irreplaceable. The company would fall apart if I left tomorrow. Right. I have to be that one that goes in. They can't do it without me. Well, that's wrong. So right, that's the right. first thing. I think the second thing is too many people confuse in the civilian world, they confuse boss with leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, we, we all know that's not the case. You you can be in charge and that's fine, but you can be the third guy in line and be a better leader than the guy in charge. And as the guy in charge, sometimes you need to recognize that the third guy in line to you is a better leader than you and let him step up. Right. Put your, put your ego down get out of the way and let this guy come up and leave because he's better at that right now. He knows more. Right. So there's, there's too much stove piping. I'm not a big fan of lateral flow charts and organ. I'm not a big fan of organizational charts anyway. <laughs> I, I, all they're good for is phone numbers for me, because to me, it's just one big blob, man. We're all here together. You know, if the right. building burns right. now, we're not going to evacuate by order of seniority on the organizational chart. You're going to get the hell out of the building. Right. So that's right. kind of the way I look at it but there's too much ego and there's too much stove piping. And I think the biggest thing that hits on me, the thing that floored me, absolutely floored me when I became a civilian is what we touched on, you know, earlier. I was taught as a Navy chief, the golden sin that you could ever commit is if you walk out of the chief's mess, you come out of a meeting with the CEO or you come out of an all, all khaki meeting and you walk on the hangar deck and you go, guys, we got to work overtime. We got to work this weekend. It's not my idea. The lieutenant mm-hmm. said we got to do it. Yeah. And I was taught from day one is you issue every order as though it were your own. You accept every order as though you gave it and planned it. You take responsibility and accountability for that order. You take responsibility for the fair execution and the success and the failure of that order. You own everything you do. Doesn't matter if you agreed with it. That's the other rule in the chief's mess. It's we have a sign over every door inside every chief's mess. What's said in the mess stays in the mess. Mm. And the chief's mess operates for those that don't know. There's always all of the chiefs, the senior chiefs or E eights, master chiefs or E nine. Then there's always one master chief. There may be several in the command, but there's one command 
master chief yes or chief of the boat the cop chief of the boat the cob yep that and in the chief's <laughs> mess it is a diplomatic dictatorship everybody has a voice but there's a 51 percent vote and that's the master chief yes that's the senior enlisted we could all agree on something if the master chief says no we're not doing it but when we by god when you walk out of that door you don't nobody knows that except us and you go down and you go we're doing this not well, he said, she said, we're going to do this. Not that the CO said we had to work overtime. Not that the CO said we're going to be extended on deployment. We're going to be expended. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. That was the biggest thing that just crushed my soul when I became a civilian and that I've been working so hard to fix is there's no, there's none of that accountability. There's no, I don't want, there's no accountability. There's no ownership. Right, I think, right. I think people that try to be leaders today don't understand what all goes into it. They think it's an office. They think it's a name plaque or a sign on your door or a parking spot. It's not. It is so much more than that. Oh, that's yeah. what's, yeah, that's what's yeah. killed me. Yeah, I know. I agree with that. That's, that's the thing I talk about the most in my books and uh, in my writings is it's just if you're in it for the perks, uh, the the parking spot, the uh, the corner office, you're going to be sadly uh, mistaken. You're going to be a terrible leader, right? Because yeah. Those are the, everybody knows that you're just in it for the perks or the paycheck or the bonus or what have you. And uh, yeah, I, I think um, what you touch on, you know, the the, the military leadership was you are responsible uh, mm-hmm. for that group of people, that mission. And you can delegate the authority. You can, you, can get, you can charge somebody with getting something done, but ultimately you're responsible for the mission and the people. Yep. And um, we tend to turn that around in civilian world. We, we delegate responsibility. We say, okay, if anything goes wrong, you're, you're in trouble. Yep. We keep all the authority. The, the leaders want to keep all the authority to themselves where you got to get approvals for everything. So we, we, we switch it around a little bit in the civilian world to the point where, um, you know, people, people get frustrated because they don't have the right authority to do their jobs and then they're held accountable for the results. And, uh, and it's just the opposite, but I, my experience in the Navy. So it sounds like very similar to you as well. I mean, do we have, do we still have time for like one quick? Yeah. Yeah. For me, recently in the civilian world, taking over a team, part of my team is off-site. They're remote over uh, Indian Head, Maryland, mm. about 30 miles away. They are a branch of mine that I pay for, but they, they, we share kind of we, – we, we share command authority over them, whatever. But they've, had, they've been in a culture for the last seven years of very um, – a micromanager. Mm. to the extreme of you don't you don't send emails without me looking at it first oh boy you don't get on the phone and talk without me listening in you don't put this out we've we've done we put some new people in place over there but i still had this team and i've been so frustrated in the last seven months of working with them i get frustrated because i i keep times like question everything i say is the boss you know right. I was, i'm like right. question everything i do challenge me i i god i wish you guys would challenge me Sometimes I want to say stupid stuff to see if anybody's going to call me out on it. Right. It's like, right. it's like, think, don't, you know, we should be asking, why can't we? Why don't we? Why shouldn't we? Why aren't we? Right. Ask me, I was like, why me to death? That's my job. That's why I get paid more than y'all. Right. Why me to death to make us better? And they won't do it. I'm like, you guys can send an email. You don't have to do this anymore. You, you're getting paid an amount of money. I'm giving you the trust. I'm giving you the authority and the responsibility to do this job. You don't need to check in with me and they won't do it. And so so it's best- almost like, yeah, they were in a cage for so long that you open the cage and you say, come on out. You don't have to yep. be in this cage anymore. And they refuse to come out. Cause that's, that's, that's how they'd operated for so many years, right? Having this micromanager controlled everything. I, I mm-hmm. told my bosses and my frustrations and it finally came to me when I was reading, I was reading out of your book and I, I don't know if you've ever read uh, it's your ship, the story. Yes. The yes. You know, I, I read through all this stuff and it came to, I had this thing. I'm like, you know what? I was like, these guys, I've given them the power. I've made them lions. I'm like, you're a lion. Roar. Go out, be a lion, be savage. Right. right. But they were a lion in the zoo. And so, you know, if I imagine a little cub lion that was raised for 20 years of its life in the zoo, if one day I come in and I throw open the door and I go, be free, little lion, be yeah. free. Yeah. He's going to step outside the door and look around and go, whoa. Yeah. I don't, 
I don't I'm, think I like this. I've never cage. been out here. Yeah. I know my yeah. cage. My cage has the straw. He comes by with meat three times a day. I go to bed at night. My cage is cool. Comfort is a cage, Dennis. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I had, and then, so what it taught me was I just have to be patient. And I think that's another thing of leadership that we need to learn too, is you have to be patient. Mm. I've had to learn that not everybody operates at mock turkey like chief chuck does <laughs> not everybody is hyped up on coffee not everybody is that go-getter i'm having to learn to not only not just adjust my style i've learned to adjust my leadership style over the years to different people yes what i've had to do is learn to adjust the leadership style that chuck chief chuck uses on chief chuck yeah in other words i've had yeah. to learn to manage my expectations and it's like just calm them down a little bit give them time they're scared Right. I've given right. them, and maybe it was my fault for all at once, giving them all of this freedom and autonomy to go do your stuff, you know? And it's like you throw a pigeon up in the air and it falls to the ground. You're like, do something. What's wrong with you? You know? <laughs> Eventually, yeah. it'll get up and fly, but you right, just have to be right. patient, so. Right, right. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's sometimes you have to, you know, I, I always say that sometimes I, I get ahead of my team. You know, I'm, yes. I'm super excited. I'm moving really fast. But, you know, I'm so far out ahead that the team is, is, hasn't caught up to me yet. So you have, to, yeah. you have to learn how to pace yourself a little bit and slow down a little bit. Yeah. You want to see, you know, you don't want to be going, you know, uh, you don't want to turn around and see no one behind you, right? As a leader, right. it's the worst feeling, right? Yeah. Um, so you have, to, you have to slow yourself down. You have to, uh, you know, set the pace, you, you know, and, and it takes a little time sometimes to get for people to recognize your, your, you know, what you're trying to do. So for me, huh? I've had to slow myself down as well too, to try to make sure I don't get too far out in front of my team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So um, a question for you, I've been asking everybody that comes on the podcast. Um, so in your opinion, what are some characteristics and we touched on some of them, but uh, what are some characteristics of a great leader? What are some characteristics of a leader worth following in your opinion? I think, you know, if you can sum it up, it's the thing that has always stuck with me the most with the lead, great leaders that I have that I considered that, you know, the the commanding officer that I'd walk through the gates of hell for, you know, all the great bosses I've had that I do the same thing is they they treated me with respect. They respected my abilities and they respected my voice that. I was a valued part of the team, mm. but also that they were willing to do exactly what I would do. They would suffer with us and they would be, they would celebrate with us. You know, a CEO that sits there, we're working late trying to change a prop on an airplane. We've been there 18 hours and he's sitting in maintenance control and he's ordering pizza for the maintenance crew and he's not going home. He's the last one out the door. They're with you. You know that if worse comes to worse, the best leader is going to have your back. Yes. That's the best quality is I know that my boss or my leader is going to have me. If all else fails, somebody's got my back. Yes. That's what makes a great leader to me. Yes. Oh, that's great. Uh, and we ha there's actually a chapter in my book about a leader that had my back. And um, my new book, I've actually got talking about my commanding officer had my back in a, in a very interesting situation where I... I chewed out somebody who outranked me. So, and I was, I was in the right and my captain backed me up. So <laughs> well, and that's, having I, that leader like that, that'll back you up is a really powerful uh, feeling as a, yeah, I, I think, the, I think there's a powerful story on your, one of your earlier podcasts too, even in your civilian world, you know, you're testing the product and the test failed horribly. Yeah. And you called yeah. your boss and he's like, all right, you know what went wrong? Yeah. All right. What's are you going to fix it? Are you going to keep talking? Yeah. I'm going to go fix it. Okay. Yes. Yes. That right there, man. And that guy, you said it too. And I felt the same way listening to it. I wanted to work for that. I don't even know who that boss is. I don't even know what widget y'all make, but I wanted to go to work there. Yes. Yeah. You know, because I would go to hell for that guy, man, because he's got your back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and he's, he's a great, he's a, he was a great leader, great man. He's, uh, he actually heard that episode. His name's uh, Bill Book. He heard that episode and, uh, he said, I remembered it well. So it was pretty, <laughs> pretty neat that he was able to hear that. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Very good. Well, um, I appreciate your time, Chuck. This has been really um, insightful. I think the the role you served in the Navy is a very unique role, and I was super excited to have you here to kind of share the nuances of of a Navy chief. It's a it's a very historical uh, position, very uh, traditional position, very important position in the Navy. And uh, I certainly wouldn't be where I'm at today without the the great chiefs that I served with. So I really do appreciate uh, you being on the show. Um, So how can people get connected with you? I know you're writing a lot of leadership articles. You have a website. Uh, You and I uh, are connected on uh, Twitter. You're very active on Twitter. So, So how can people get connected with you? The best way to connect with me is at on Twitter um, at Chief Chuck Two K. Um, that's the easiest way to get a hold of everything that I do in my bio. If you go to my profile page, it'll take you to my blog site. It'll take you uh, to a couple other things. I have a, a pin tweet. I also have uh, another alternate uh, Twitter site. It's uh, Fortis Leadership, um, and that's at Fortis F O R. T I S D U T U S Fortis Ductus, which means always strong mm. or always leader or always discipline or something. I, I came up with something, but I'm trying to transition that over. It's going to be a leadership site. It's still a work in progress. Um, I've got to learn to separate my antics on Twitter from what I really want to talk about. Which is leadership. <laughs> um, I can't pass up a good dad joke. So that you are a master at dad jokes. We didn't bring that up, but uh, if you follow Chief Chuck, uh, he's a Chief Chief Chuck 2K, right? At Chief yeah, Chuck at Chief Chuck Two K. You, you um, have to follow him just for the dad yeah. jokes. If, if if even if you're not interested in leadership, which I hope you are, yeah, uh, you should follow just for the dad jokes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. So and I, and I appreciate you having me on. It's, I, I love talking about leadership. I think it's important, you know, and I think it's important for the next generation to learn how to be good leaders. So, Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. So I will uh, go ahead and I'll put all those uh, links in the show notes. So you okay. can, uh, if you look at the show notes, uh, those that are listening, go to the show notes and I'll have links to uh, everything that uh, Chief Chuck does. And uh, you, you'll, you'll want to follow him on, on, uh, on Twitter like I do because it's always really good insightful uh, comments every day. So you want that in your feed. And, you know, social media can be a good thing if you set yourself up right. Uh, you can sit there and debate and argue with people all day long, or you can learn something. And I, I choose to use Twitter as a learning learning uh, tool. And um, I'm learning from, from guys like Chuck every day. So uh, thank you, thank Chuck, you. for being on. Oh, thank you. And thank you for doing this because it's it's been a great inspiration to me and, and seeing all the great leadership stuff we have on social media is, is very heartwarming. Gives yes. you hope. Yes, it really does. So I encourage everybody to connect with Chief Chuck uh, because if you want to be a great leader, you really want to listen to the lessons of people that have, that have been there, done that, and you want to spend uh, time with people who have been in the trenches for years. So uh, thank you, Chuck, for all your insight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, that's it for today. And uh, thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Till next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care.